Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. Um, we're going to do uh, defending the Trinity again. Uh, I was falling asleep last night and uh, was feeling a bit tired, uh, so I'm redoing the video. And um, we'll do uh, a long series, uh, maybe. Um, maybe three or four videos okay so this is part one and uh, <clears throat> we'll do uh, some next week now we're looking at <clears throat> defending the Trinity <clears throat> in a book called a new systematic theology of the Christian faith by dr. Robert L Raymond published by Nelson dr. L Robert L. R Raymond uh, is a very, very good theologian in his systematic theology. I've read other things of his. I've found his other work a bit difficult at times, but this work is absolutely wonderful. It's one of the best systematic theology books that you could get. So we're just going to do 20 minutes on this and then maybe uh, I'll do something tonight or maybe something in the morning on a Sunday morning we might do two or three of these videos okay now um, let's pray Lord we thank you for this day uh, we thank you for your love and Lord we confess all our sin and failure and the weakness of our hearts we pray that you will forgive us and cleanse us Lord that you be with us now in Jesus name Amen so in the Westminster Confession it says in the unity of the Godhead there be three persons of one substance power and eternity God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Ghost the Father is of none neither begotten nor proceeding the Son is eternally begotten of the Father and the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Um, Raymond says the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible and neither do the expressions sameness and substance and distinct subs in substance. Nevertheless the church from the third century on found such expressions helpful expurgating the teaching of scripture on the tri-personality of the Godhead being convinced as Benjamin Warfield states in a somewhat startling fashion that it is better to preserve the truth of scripture than the words of scripture which is just to say contrary to what Unitarians would think and say that the church has propounded its distinctive view of the tri-personality of the one what, uh, one true God not because it, it became enamored of Greek thought or followed the spurious hermeneutic because it was convinced that the Trinity had revealed doctrine um, yeah so uh, you know the, there are these accusations that uh, the early church fathers were interested in Greek philosophy and that's why they came up with the Trinity and that that's not true because they they just wanted to teach what the Bible taught on the Trinity so historical nature of its revelation of the Trinity's revelation Raymond says it is unlikely that anyone familiar with reading only the Old Testament today with no knowledge of New Testament would conclude that within the inner life of the divine being resides a real and distinct personal manifoldness this is not to suggest however that the Old Testament is not Trinitarian for it is to the core nor is it to suggest that the saints of the Old Testament who had the benefit of enlightened prophets of God living among them and who could therefore consult them respecting the meaning of their writings were totally ignorant of a personal manifoldness in God it is just taking seriously the fact that the Old Testament revelation per se as a written corpus to use War Warfield's delightful metaphor is like quote B.B. Warfield 
a chamber richly furnished but dimly lighted. The introduction of light brings into it nothing which was not in it before, but it brings out in a clearer view much of what is in it, but was only dimly or even not at all perceived before. The mystery of the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament, but the mystery of the Trinity underlies the Old Testament revelation, and here and there almost comes into view. Thus the Old Testament revelation is not cor corrected by the fuller revelation which follows it, but only perfected, extended and enlarged. End of quote, B.B. Warfield. Raymond says the New Testament writers, thorough, thoroughly Trinitarian in their theology, evidently saw no congruity between the doctrine of God and monotheism of the Old Testament. Accordingly, it is quite proper to use that the following phenomena are all to be reviewed as enumerations of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. The plural quotative let us make and the plural pronoun are in Genesis 1.20, let us make man in our image in Genesis 3.22, Genesis 11.7, Isaiah 6.8. Number two, those juxtapositions of some title for God which differentiate God in the same sense from God in another sense as in Psalm 45, 6 and 7, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You love righteousness and hate wickedness, therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions, Hebrews 1, 8. Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Matthew 22, 41, 45, also Numbers 6, 24, Isaiah 33, 22, and Daniel 9, 19. Number three, the angel of the Lord, who is both identified as God and yet differentiated from God. Genesis 16, 7 to 13. Genesis chapter 22 from verse 1 to 2, 11 to 18, Genesis 24 verse 7, Genesis 40 verse 28, sorry, sorry, Genesis 28 verse 10 to 17, Genesis 31 verse 11 to 13, Genesis 32 verse 9 to 12, and 24 to 30, Genesis 48 verse 15 to 16, Exodus chapter 3 verse 2 to 6, Exodus chapter 13 21, and four, Exodus 14 19, Exodus 23 20 to 23, and Exodus 33 14, 32 24, 34, Joshua 5 13 to 15, Judges chapter 6 11 to 24, Judges 13 chapter, th uh, chapter 13 verse 3 to 22, to Samuel chapter 24 verse 16, Hosea chapter 12 verse 4, Zechariah chapter 12 verse 8, and Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Number 4, those passages which depict God's word and spirit virtually core causes with God of his work as in Genesis 1-2, and the spirit of God hovered, hovered over the face of the waters, Psalm 33-6, by the word of the Lord, with the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. John chapter 1 verse 1 and 3, Isaiah 42 verse 1, Isaiah 43 verse 9 to 12, Haggai chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. Number 5, those passages which tend to personalize God's word as in Psalm 1720, he set forth his word and healed them. Genesis 1 3, Psalm 33 6, Psalm 147 verse 15 to 18, Isaiah 55 verse 11. And which tend to do the same with God's Spirit as in Isaiah 63 10, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Isaiah 48 16, Ezekiel 2, chapter 2 verse 2, chapter 8 verse 3, Zechariah 7, chapter 7 verse 12. Those passages in which the Messiah, as a divine speaker, refers to the Lord or the Spirit as having sent him, 
as in Isaiah 48 verse 16. From the first announcement I have not spoken in secret at, at the time it happens I am here. And now the Sovereign Lord sent me with his spirit, Isaiah 61 1. The spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, Luke chapter 4 verse 16 18. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 10 and 11 Shout and be glad, O daughters of Zion, for I am coming and will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. 7. Those passages which the prophet speaks of the Lord and the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit as virtually distinct persons, as in Isaiah 63, 9 and 10. In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of the presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of all. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned to become their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Verse eight, uh, Number 8. And finally, those passages in which a plural noun is employed to refer to God. These could be plurals of intensification, however, on the analogy of Elohim, such as Psalm 149, verse 2. Let Israel rejoice in his literally makers. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember your creator. The Hebrew is literally creators in the days of your youth. Isaiah 54, 5, for your maker, literally makers, in, is your husband. Literally husbands, the Lord Almighty is his name. On the other hand, we turn to passages in the New Testament and we find the doctrine of the true, true, iron, true iron character of God everywhere assumed. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Mark chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, John chapter 14, verse 16 to 26, John chapter 15, verse 26, John 16, chapter 16, verse 5 and 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 and 6, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, chapter 13, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 14, Ephesians 2 verse 18, uh, Ephesians 4 verse 4 and 6, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 and 6, Romans 8 verse 1 to 11, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 verse 13 and 14, Titus chapter 3 verse 4 and 6, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, Jude verse 20 and 21, Revelation verse chapter 1 verse 4. Not struggling uh, to be born, but already on the scene and fully assimilated in the thoughts formed of the Christian community. That is to say, in the New Testament, the doctrine is not in the making through rigorous debate and theological reflection, but already made. But already made. How do we account for the fact that the Old Testament seems to have been written before its revelation? while the New Testament seems to have been written after its revelation to cite Warfield. The revelation itself was made not in word but in deed. It was made in the incarnation of the Son of God and the outpouring of God and the Holy Spirit. The relation of the two testaments to the revelation is the one case that of preparation for it and the other that of product of it. The revelation itself is embodied just as in Christ and the Holy Spirit. It has been often said as the reason lying behind the determination of the divine wisdom to reveal the fact of the Trinity in this matter that it was the task of the Old Testament to fix firmly in the minds and the hearts of the people of God the great fundamental truth of the unity of God and it would have been dangerous to speak to them of the plurality within this unity until this task had been fully accomplished but as Warfield argues, it is more likely that the full revelation of the Godhead's personal, personal manifoldness was necessarily tied to the unfolding of the redemptive process. 
and that as that process materialized, the revelation of the Trinity necessarily was disclosed as its corollary. Quote B.B. Warfield. Well, I'll just check that if that is Warfield. Yeah. B.B. Warfield. Um, the revelation of the Trinity was the inevitable effect of the accomplishment of redemption. It was in the coming of the Son of God in the light sinful flesh to offer himself a sacrifice for sin and in the coming of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment that the Trinity of the persons in the unity of the Godhead was once, once and for all revealed to men. Those who knew God the Father who loved them and gave this, his own Son to die for them and the Lord Jesus Christ who loved them and delivered himself up as an offering and sacrifice for them. The Spirit of grace who loved them and dwell with them, a power not themselves making for righteousness, knew the true true I am God, and could not think or speak of God otherwise than as true I am. The doctrine of the Trinity, in other words, is simply the modification wrought of the conception of the only God by his complete revelation of himself in the redemptive process. It is necessary, necessarily weighted, therefore, upon the completion by thus by the fundamental revelation of the Trinity in fact that is to say in the incarnation of God the Son and the outpouring of God the Holy Spirit in a word, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the fundamental proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. This is as much as to say that all the evidence for whatever kind and from whatever source derive that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. It's just so much evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity that when we go to the New Testament for evidence of the Trinity, we are to seek for it not merely the scattered allusions to the Trinity as such, numerous and in in constructive, instructive as they are, but primarily in the whole mass of evidence which the New Testament provides of the deity of Christ and the divine personality of the Holy Spirit. End of quote. That's B.B. Warfield. This is exactly what might be expected. The Bible never deals with the doctrine of the Trinity as an, as an abstract truth, but reveals the Trinitarian life in its various revelations as a living reality to a certain extent in connection with the works of creation and providence, but particularly in relation to the work of redemption. Its most fundamental revelation is a revelation given in facts rather than in words. This revelation increases in clarity in the measure in which the redemptive work of God is more clearly revealed as in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the more the glorious reality of the Trinity stands out in the facts of history. The clearer the statements of the doctrine become, the fuller revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament is due to the fact that the Word became flesh and that the Holy Spirit to cup its evolved in the church. Raymond says, it, is a, it was in some the two great objective redemptive events of the Incarnation and Pentecost which precipitated and concentrized the modification in the thinking of the first Christians about the one living and true God because they were convinced that men had been confronted by nothing less than the unbridged glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.6 and that the Holy Spirit possessed a personal subsistence with the Father and the Son. First Christians were given the impetus to formulate their understanding of God in Trinitarian terms. The evidence for the Trinity then, since the deity and personal subsistence of the Father may be viewed as a given, is just the biblical evidence for the deity of Jesus. 
Christ and the distinct personal subsistence of God, the Holy Spirit. Said another way, whatever biblical evidence were ever expressed in Holy Scripture, which can be adduced in support of the deity of Christ and the personal subsistence of the Holy Spirit, is evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity. Accordingly, the larger portion of the remainder of this chapter will de be devoted to the adduction of the biblical evidence for the deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit's personal subsistence. So we'll leave it there. Um, we'll be getting into this series. Be, it'll be quite a lengthy series, I think. We'll, we'll be doing about six videos, maybe more. Um, and we'll be going into the biblical evidence of the Trinity in a lot more detail. What, what we've just gone here is just reflected about the Old Testament really about is the Trinity in the Old Testament and look to the th few theologians what they think the Old Testament is saying um, in the next few videos we'll be going into looking at the deity of the Son and we'll be looking at uh, biblical evidence for that we'll be looking at quite a lot of scriptures I'll be actually reading those scriptures out in the next few videos so this was just like a general opening to reflect on why would there be a trinity you know why why a trinity and what the theologians are saying is the fact that in the New Testament we're seeing um, I just shut up we're seeing um, the, the deity of Jesus, the, the revelation of the deity of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit it, it, it's these facts that are very clear that led the church to see that Jesus is divine and the Holy Spirit is divine and then had to conclude that because they are divine that there is one God in three persons okay so in the next couple of days We'll be going through this, and uh, also watch out for um, for the uh, Reformed Dogmatic series. I'll be uh, doing a video maybe tonight on that. Uh, we'll be we'll be continuing going through Burkhoff Systematic Theology, and don't forget that we've got to Google Hangout on Immanuel Kant next week where we will be looking at Kant's Critic of Pure Reason and uh, next week we'll be having a few Bible studies uh, so I'll look out for that okay so I hope that was uh, a help to start with I'll lead you with some links that you can read concerning the Trinity under this video uh, tomorrow okay so I'll be putting a few references for you that you can go and actually read as we go through this series so this is going to be a long series uh, and it's going to be a very detailed series on the Trinity I feel that this is needed to be done so we'll, we will be going in a lot of deep theological detail we'll be looking at a lot of scriptures a lot of theologians and we'll be uh, really getting to grips with this doctrine and this will be a good resource for you to pass on to friends okay so thank you for listening and take care